Good morning. It's good to see you all once again. It's been stayed already. Um, if you're visiting with us, we're so glad you're here. If you have not, not yet gotten a welcome packet, please see one of our deacons on the way out. And if you filled out that visitor's card, uh, just drop it in the basket on the way out or just give it to one of the members here. They'll know what to do with that. And again, we're so appreciative that you've chosen to be with the Lord's people here on his day to worship him in spirit and in truth. If you want to open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs this morning, in our daily Bible reading, we've been spending the last month or so, because we've gotten to uh, King Solomon's reign in, in the book of Kings, that we've been spending time with the wisdom literature that Solomon wrote. Uh, in fact, we've been spending a lot of time with Proverbs and the Song of Songs. And so this morning, I thought it'd be good for us to consider why should a Christian, or what benefit is there for a Christian, to study and to read the book of Proverbs. It's unfortunate to me, I understand why our daily Bible reading program has us go through that book so very quickly, but it's unfortunate to me because, uh, that we do it so quickly because Proverbs was not meant to be read at that kind of pace. There are those pithy little statements, and really the way to use those, as we'll see in this lesson, is pick one of them and really think and mold over, over a whole week and chew on and figure out how does it apply, what does it mean, and, and what areas of my life does this really, is this applicable for? And so with that, we want to just jump right in. We're going to be starting uh, kind of uh, in, in chapter 9 to begin with. I know a little bit backwards way, but we'll, we'll see why in just a moment. Uh, a pro book of Proverbs presents before the reader a contrast between wisdom and folly. In fact, the first nine chapters isn't those pithy little sayings we're used to reading. It's two dialogues or two sets of discourses between the woman of folly and the woman of wisdom. And the writer of Proverbs, which is King Solomon, at least the first major part of it, that we have a few Proverbs from King Lamel and some others towards the end of the book, but King Solomon's whole purpose in assembling such a collection is so that we would see in contrast what the right path is. And that's why those first nine chapters are this discourse. One quick point here, actually, in chapter 1 and verse 8. We, hear, we see here that Solomon is writing to his son. He says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. This is important to note because we might ask the question, well, why is wisdom and folly personified as women? And he's not making any sort of universal statement here other than he is presenting, Solomon's presenting the, the, the two choices to his young son, as personified as women to present them as equally alluring choices in life to a young person or anyone at the beginning of life who not a negative thing just does not know anything hasn't lived life hasn't had the experience of living hasn't acquired wisdom both choices are alluring because what we have in wisdom oh well, it's the skill of living it's practical it's the ability to navigate life in all of its twists and turns. And that becomes abundantly clear when we read through the book of Proverbs about what wisdom does. It works in season. It harvests at the appropriate time. It is studious. It, is, it is, seeks to understand. Folly is not given a nice, neat little definition because folly is normally defined as whatever wisdom is not. It's contrast. And we might think of wisdom of, as folly as the path of least resistance. And so to a young person, to a person beginning their, their life, they might see the benefits of wisdom and say, yeah, that's pretty good. But they also see the path of folly and go, yeah, but that's easier. I'll take an example because I know my brother is not watching. <laughs> Let's take finances and building wealth, right? Uh, Dave Ramsey's done that giant study of, of millionaires in this country, over 500,000 they've interviewed, and they found that millionaires on the whole are pretty boring people. Uh, they live below their means, they pay off their houses early, um, they put money away in a boring mutual fund and they just let it sit there. That's wisdom, doing things that work, right? Well, folly is trying to cash in on, remember all that GameStop stock fiasco a couple of years ago where everybody was buying really cheap stock and it was artificially driving up the price. At Christmas, my brother was bragging like, yeah, I made $8,000 on GameStop. I'm like, okay. Six months later, later he lost 4,000 of it. 
because inevitably a stock that rises that quickly is going to tumble. And don't get me started on cryptocurrency. <laughs> that uh, Janice Roberts can tell you all about that. There's some people who made tons of money off of that and they lost it all. Well, guess what? Still got to pay taxes on that. It looks like the path of, it looks like an easy path, right? It's not a wise path. There's a reason why mankind's been doing this. There's a reason why certain things are done, have been done for centuries, because they work. They work. And so to a young person, this is why Solomon's presenting it this way. He's like, son, you're going to have two paths in life. They both look really good, but only one is the right one. And instead of spoon feeding the answer, Solomon simply just presents the both paths, what they offer, and he knows that for his son and for us who read it today, that the contrast should be clear when we see the end result of both of these paths. And Proverbs chapter 9 really illustrates this contrast, and that's where we're going to be beginning this morning. I know we said a little while ago we'd be looking at that, but Proverbs chapter 9, we're getting the last bit of the dueling uh, discourses between the woman of wisdom and the woman of folly. And here we see the wisdom and folly's invitation to dine with them. Now, real quick, to, to share a meal with somebody in the ancient world, because a lot of resources went into it, you know, Solomon could not go down to Bash's or Costco and get enough food to feed, you know, 40 people. You had to plant the seed. You had to harvest it. You had to butcher your pig. There was no, there was no Albertsons, you know, taking take and bake uh, uh, dinners, ready to go. It was a lot of effort. And to dine with somebody also was an invitation to fellowship, association, camaraderie ship. That's why, for example, in the New Testament, 2 John 9 through 11, why John tells us of false teachers, do not welcome them, do not invite them to their home. That's a sign of fellowship, of association, of intimacy. So the reason why this illustration is where they're offering us to dine with them, they're offering us relationship. Who is going to be your close companion in life? Is it going to be folly or is it going to be wisdom? So let's see what this says. Verse 1. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has prepared her food. She has mixed her wine. She, <clears throat> she has also set her table. She has sent out her maidens. She calls from the tops of the heights of the city. Whoever is naive, let him turn in here. To him who lacks understanding, she says, come and eat my food and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake your folly and live and proceed in the way of understanding. He who corrects a scoffer gets dishonor for himself. And he who reproves a wicked man gets insults for himself. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in his learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me, your days will be multiplied, and years of your life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself, and if you scoff, you alone will bear it. The woman of folly is boisterous. She is naive and knows nothing. She sits at the doorway of her house, on a seat by the high places of the city, calling to all those who pass by, who are making their path straight. Whoever is naive, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks understanding, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he, do, he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. The contrast here is that wisdom, she has been industrious. She has set her house in order. She has prepared her table. She has made all the preparations, and she beckons to all who would walk by, come, you who know nothing, come, who, you who lack understanding, I will give you wisdom. I will give you understanding if you will take me as your close companion, that your days will be lengthened, and you will be prosperous. By contrast, the woman of folly, she is allowed no nothing individual, and she also is beckoning the people, but... She has not prepared her table. She has not prepared her home. Her table is spread with stolen goods. And, and the writer tells us here that whether men know it or not, her table, her table leads to the grave. 
It's a sense that Sheol is being used here. It's a Hebrew term meant either the afterlife in some context or simply the pit or the grave. That the path of folly does not end well. That the path of folly often ends with people's demise. And we see this kind of played out, right? In our own human ways and in, in, in the world in which we live. That, you know, take for example the temptations that plague young people when they go into high school or college. At least the temptations that we're always told plague young people. And they're there, don't get me wrong, they're there. Uh, fornication, excess of drugs and alcohol, things to abuse the body. In fact, there's a. The, the irony of some of this is it was illustrated by a comedy skit I watched online with a comedy group that these people are working in an office and in comes this one woman who's. She's vegan and organic and all this stuff, and an individual cracks open a Coke, you know, a soda. Says, well, I wouldn't put that toxic stuff in my body. And then they show her doing a line of cocaine on the table. And the, the illustration is, sometimes the hypocritical nature of young people is, oh, I, I live all organically, but drugs, alcohol, and, and all that kind of stuff, yeah, yeah I'll, do, I'll put that in my body. And I'll condemn people who enjoy a Coca-Cola or something. But you think about how it plays out in our own bodies. Those who, quote, live it up in their youth by participating in those things without any inhibitions and, and no restrictions end up paying a hefty price later on in life. My dad would take us on drives because when I was younger we had nothing, so that's what you did for fun. And one of the things he would point out to me when we would drive by the park is all the people he went to high school with who are now homeless, and some were drug addicts. And he pointed out to us, his son, that's why you don't do drugs. That's why you don't, quote, try and have a fun time with what people say you need to have a fun time with, because that's where you'll end up. And he said, I almost ended up there. But that, that's, that's your path if you take that course of action. And I would suggest to you that's what Solomon's doing. He's showing the end result of these two paths in life and says, the choice is yours. Will you have wisdom as your companion to make you wise and, and knowledgeable? Or will you take the path of least resistance, which oftentimes results in an early grave? Now, turning back to the first chapter of Proverbs, if this is the contrast, you know, what are the aims and goals of the book? Solomon in the prologue, in verses 2 through 7 of chapter 1, lays it all out for us and actually gives us a few keys to help us understand the book of how to interpret and how to think on the Proverbs. In verses 2 and 3, well, starting in verse 1, rather, it says, The proverb of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of, the, of understanding, to receive instruction and in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. These two verses show us what is, the, what is the goal, what is the aim of the book. That Solomon is compiling all this, he's writing the Proverbs, he's compiling the Proverbs to give us instruction on in righteous living in order to be wise in life. And for the Bible writers, wisdom is not this abstract thing. It is not simply more knowledge. We've met many people who have tons of knowledge and were some of the most unwise people you might have met. And yet you can meet other people who do not have any degrees, and they might be the most profound, wisest men you, or women you've ever met. Wisdom in the Bible is inherently moral. That's why he says in verse 3, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. These are wisdom's companions. How do we navigate life in a way that is equitable to all, that is just, is right before God, and is... And, it shows discernment in how we should conduct ourselves. The effect of the book is seen in the next couple book, uh, verses. Excuse me. Verses 4 and 5, Solomon identifies two of the potential audiences that he's, he's writing for. To give prudence to the naive, to the youth knowledge and dis, uh, discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Really two or three groups of people he's writing to. The naive, the young, and the wise. Now, naive can sometimes have negative connotations in our current language, but naive in the book of Proverbs is not a negative term. It's not even a positive term. It's just to describe somebody who does not know but can learn. And in that regard, all of us 
in some areas of life, we're all naive. We don't know, but we can learn. And so what Solomon says is to those who know that they don't know, that this book will give discernment or prudence to them. To the youth, it will give knowledge and discretion. A lot of the lessons my dad gave me were don't make the same mistakes we did. And because my, what my parents did in their youth, my mom and my dad, I couldn't get away with anything. In fact, I joked with my friends, sometimes because they knew all that went on in the world, if I want to do anything with my friends, I'm sorry, but you need to submit a, uh, a hangout form three weeks in advance and triplicate before my parents to approve it. And they had become really good friends with the town cops too. So again, couldn't get away with anything. And my dad, one, one of the stories he told me and what made me try and listen to my parents is that one time my dad, when he was 16, 17, got taken home to his mom and dad by the cops. And my dad was thrown attitude, because he's the youngest of six, I believe. Um, and the cop took him off to the side, and he looked at him and he pointed at his parents. He says, those two people right there are the best and only real friends you've got. No one else is going to care for you like they're going to care for you. No one else wants the best for you like they're going to want the best for you. Your friends may say they do, but push come to shove, your friends are going to desert you. It was the people who my dad was hanging out with. And so my dad has told me a lot of lessons he's had to learn the hard way, and he's given me that so I could learn the lessons without having to go through the experience. And we think about Solomon's life. He had a lot of lessons he learned the right way and a lot of lessons he learned the hard way. And so a lot of what he has to say in Proverbs is so that his sons, his children would not have to go through the same experiences he went through. And we know what the Bible says about Solomon, right? The wisest man who ever lived. He's given that, God has preserved Proverbs for our purpose, our, our benefit, the same reason why Solomon wrote these. So we could learn from his triumphs and tribulations and not make the same mistakes. And to the wise, we may think, well, why does the wise need more wisdom? Well, Wise understand the value of wisdom and will increase in their understanding and their application of that knowledge. There is one group that this book is not for, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But the next thing we need to consider is that God has given us two or three keys here to understand the book in verses 6 through 7. Actually, back up to verse 5. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So what are the couple keys here? First, it's found in verse 7. I think this is a very basic point but needs to be stated. Knowledge and wisdom begin with God. There is no true knowledge, there is no true wisdom, unless the fear of the Lord is rooted at the center of it. Um, it's out in theaters right now. Some of you may have seen it, the new Jurassic World movie. Um, sad thing is, and I'm not going to reveal anything, so. But I thought they changed the message of what the original book was about, because the original film and book, Jurassic Park, was about the dangers of playing God, and about the dangers of unchecked knowledge, about the dangers of asking where or not we could instead of where or not we should. And any knowledge, any wisdom that's not tempered by a fear of God will lead us into lunacy, will lead us into rejecting reality. And the fear here, I know we're often, we often say that the fear of the Lord is deep reverence, and that's true. But here is also the kind of quaking in your boots fear, too, of recognizing who God is. He is the creator of all there is. He is absolute sovereign Lord. That's worthy of recognizing his great power, which might bring some trembling, but also great respect. That if unless we, our knowledge is tempered with that fear, we're going to go off into crazy land. You know, I know it's on the screen, but just a quick illustration of that, if you want to turn over to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, we see, we see what happens when we reject God as the center of our knowledge. 
and the beginning of our knowledge. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Romans 1 and verse 21. Speaking of those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, it says in 21, For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You know, brethren, it is interesting to me that you want to think of a period of scientific discovery in which advancements were being made for our better health, of better communication, of better transport, whatever it is. It was during an age in which many of those making those discoveries, at least on some level, had some level of belief in Almighty God. That the guy actually who created the MRI machine so we could actually start doing scans of inside the body and, and, and their brains and stuff, he was a, he is a believer. That you have individuals who want to eradicate disease because they felt compelled by the teachings of Scripture to alleviate suffering. But once we rejected God from our scientific and intellectual pursuits, we started getting all sorts of crazy made-up disciplines. You know, the funny thing with my college was that it was an old school. We still had chalkboards in our classrooms and wood, wood, wood desks to sit in our lecture halls, poor lighting. And yet, when I was there, they announced two new vice presidents, vice presidents of gender studies and I forgot some other made-up dis discipline. Their starting salary was half a million dollars apiece. So they got, huh. That could have remodeled Kramer Hall. That might have been able to fix the wobbly tables in the brand new cafeteria. Hmm, okay. And sometimes it's led certain disciplines to just outright reject reality. But that's where we end up if we reject God as the centerpiece of our knowledge. So we have to understand knowledge begins with God. And secondly, knowledge is, wisdom does not come easy. That's why I read verses 5 and 6. Go back to Proverbs chapter 1, verses 5. So the wise man will increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Well, what's the purpose? Verse 6 tells us. He does this to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. We'll talk more on this in, in just the next, in the next point. But proverbs are not universal maxims. Their principles be applied in certain situations. The old saying is, they're proverbs, not promises. So you have to think on what does the proverb mean and how might I apply it. Now, before we quickly move on on that same point, we're going to talk more about that, is, again, verse 7. We need to understand, too, that there's one class of people that the book of Proverbs will be useless for. In fact, the whole Bible will be useless for. And that is who the proverb writer calls a fool. They're ones who despise wisdom and instruction. They, they don't bother with increasing in their understanding, or perhaps they might have something new to learn from somebody else. I have found that actually if you adopt the philosophy of every room you walk in, there's somebody in there that can teach you something, life is a lot more fascinating. <laughs> and you, it's a constant uh, experience of discovery and learning. And that's what God wants us to be. He never wants us to stop searching the book of talking to others, of searching out answers, because he has them. But back to the universal maxim thing for just a moment. A proverb is a poetic form, and it states the truth in as concise of manner as possible. So it, by its very nature, it cannot be exhaustive. You know, we have proverbs, we have proverbs in our own vernacular, the early bird gets the worm. We've all heard that at some point. Well, we're not literally getting worms, but we understand that those who show up early tend to get what they want because they're there. Look at Black Friday. Not an endorsement of that holiday at all. Um, but we have Proverbs, and you have to understand the figure in order to um, figure out how they apply. Uh, this is why if you want to, in language learning, for example, 
the, the true mark of mastery of a language is when you can understand idioms and proverbs in the native tongue. Because oftentimes the idioms and proverbs rely upon wordplay and cultural understanding. That's why a friend of mine, Yermo, who preaches over in Ohio, and sometimes has no idea what I mean by certain English idioms or proverbs. Because he didn't grow up here. He didn't grow up with the culture. And just like he'll say idioms and proverbs in Mexico, and I have no idea, no idea what they mean. Proverbs is kind of like that. It's, written, it's translated, yes, into wording that we can understand, but sometimes we have a proverb that, well, what did that mean for the Hebrews? Because, you know, a proverb, this proverb writer makes it very clear that a proverb said at the right time is a very good thing. In Proverbs chapter 1, 5 through 6, I just want to reference this again. Again, the wise man increases learning and understanding wise counsel to understand a proverb. In chapter 15 and verse 23, Proverbs 15, verse 23, a man has joy in an apt answer. How delightful is a timely word. And again, in 25 and verse 11, we see here again that there's, there's value and we need to learn how to use our words rightly. He says here in 25, 11, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Now, by contrast to that, a proverb used at the wrong time is useless. Proverbs 26 and verse 7. Like legs which are useless to the lame, so is a proverb in the mouth of fools. And you look in verse 9. Like a thorn which falls into the hand of a drunkard, so is a proverb in the mouth of fools. So what Solomon's saying here is just like perhaps a paralegic who's in a wheelchair. He says a proverb spoken by a fool is like the legs of the paralegic, of no use. Or a proverb spoken by a fool is like a drunk man who falls into a briar bush and doesn't feel a thing. Because oftentimes when a proverb is used inaccurately and wrongly, sometimes the fool doesn't realize the proverb applies more to them than it does anyone they're using it against. And so it takes time. You know, if we read a proverb, we have to think on it and meditate, and when might it be applied? So very quickly here, I appreciate your attention this morning. I just want to go over a few potent proverbs that we can think about maybe this week of their universal application, or maybe not necessarily that, but the areas in which our life we can apply them. I'm going to throw them all up on the board real quick, just because I appreciate you being a good audience so far this morning. And let's just start in chapter 10, verse 19. Very quickly here. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 19. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. Now let's just think on that real quick of how that might be rightly applied and how might that be wrongly applied. So rightly applied is in general, yes. If you're a motor mouth, you're probably going to talk yourself into trouble. I know some of you are going to laugh and smirk when I say this, but when I was a younger preacher, uh, Bob's laughing, I knew he would, I had what every young preacher has, chronic foot and mouth disease. Because you say things, you're up there, you're talking, 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 and eventually you're going to say something that may not be wrong, but you didn't say in the best possible way, or you unintentionally insulted somebody or something. Foot, mouth, fool. Um, in general, that, that's application, especially if you're teaching or preaching or talking to somebody, fewer words, the better. Just like he says at the end, he who restrains his lips is wise. Now, here's how a fool would apply that. Say I get up here and I start going off the rails, denying the divinity of Jesus or something, saying that his blood doesn't save or that kind of stuff. And say, you know, one of you one of the married couples, uh, you know, say Steve wants to get up and, and, and rebuke that. It's false teaching, it's denial of Christ, it's heresy, it's blasphemy. The fool would say, mm, remember Steve, he who restrains his lips is wise. Well, no, that's wrong. There was false doctrine taught. We're told explicitly in Ephesians that we are to expose false doctrine and we're to do it in truth and love. 
So you see, it just, that's a quick illustration of why you, we have to think on how to apply these. Uh, Proverbs 13, verse 20, for example. Just one or two more here. Proverbs 13, verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Companionships, friendships matter. Don't be surprised if you're around wise people, you're going to get more wise. Or if you're around fools, then they're going to drag you down to their level. And what he says here, fools will suffer harm. It always seems interesting. There's certain friendships you might have that they're always calling you for something. Bail you out of a situation. You know, in general, this is, you think about, you're making wise choices with your companions. And in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, before we close here this morning. Proverbs 16, verse 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules a spirit than he who captures a city. Now, we don't capture cities like they did in the ancient world, and I don't know the last time I captured a city, nor you. But if anyone, if we have an awareness of how warfare works, or even how warfare works today, um, we can understand this proverb. You know, there was a lot of fight, there still is a lot of fight in Ukraine, sadly. Um, but certain cities have been focal points of, of the war. Of, if they captured Kiev, for example, that's, that could mean the downfall of Ukraine or something. So we can understand, so we have that image in mind, and we're trying to think about this proverb. It says, okay, a person that's slow to anger is stronger or better than the mighty, and one who rules the spirit is better than the one who captures the city. Now think of it this way is, you can get far in life if you wave a big stick and you just have this raw power behind you, but the person who has the real power who is the one who can control himself completely. Um, don't fault me for this. The one time I was in a bowling league, there was one guy in the league who basically had no neck. He was this, this jack, basically. And when he would throw his ball, it would not touch the lane at all. It would just hit the pins, and we're pretty sure the pins just ran away out of fear because when it hit, it hit. This guy got through with brute force most of his score. And then there was this other guy, really old, very frail, he had this contraption to keep his arm, you know, all locked up in place. And he just kind of scooted up there and just threw it up the middle of the lane and barely moved his wrist. That guy had a better, was higher accuracy and had a better score than the big buff guy who just made the peers, that made, made the pins flee out of fear. You can get lucky with pure mind, but the person who can control themselves and knows what they're doing, they can fail the mighty. And that's what Solomon's saying here is, if you can control your spirit, if you have self-control, you're better off in life than any of the strongest men out there. Because you've conquered the most, you've conquered and you've ruled over the most unruly person there is, yourself. You're in full control of your faculties. So this week, maybe some homework. Maybe just peruse the Proverbs this afternoon. And whatever one just like grabs your eyes, Think on it. Write it on a card. Carry it with you this week. Mull over. You know, Proverbs, there's a proverb that speaks to every situation. I'm, I'm convinced of that. A proverb of, of encouragement, a proverb of rebuke, maybe to a temptation you're dealing with. Find that proverb and write it down. Think on it. Meditate on it. Um, I'll tell you one that I, I oftentimes think on. It's Proverbs 24, verse 16. The lesson will be yours. Proverbs 24 and verse 16. For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in time of calamity. Why do I oftentimes meditate on this? Because I think all of us have a tendency to feel like we need to do the right things all the time, and we need to do everything perfectly. At least maybe that's my own brain. And when failure comes, I need to be reminded that the righteous are not perfect, but the righteous pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and keep on the path of faith. So when I stumble, or I have a bad day, I'm often reminded of this proverb, that I have the hope and I have the promises that I can get up and walk again because God's with me. 
And I remind that the wicked don't have that. When trial and tribulation come, they have no one to turn to. I have God at least. I say at least. He's the greatest that you could have. Appreciate your attention this morning. Please think on these Proverbs. I hope this has encouraged you to consider the Proverbs even more. Maybe go home today and dive deep into it. And while every lesson we can't preach can be on salvation, we never want to close an hour of worship without briefly going over the Lord's plan of salvation. And maybe you're here this morning, maybe that's not your need, but you might have a spiritual need this morning. We remind, remember that Jesus was very clear for us. Now, all these scriptures, you can write them down, and this, this is not my words, it's not this church's words, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus, on one occasion, when he said to the Pharisees, who were denying that he actually was gone the flesh, he said in John 8, verse 24, unless you believe that I am he, you will likewise perish. On another occasion, when they were questioning about the men who had a tower fall on them and were wondering who, who were the sinners, Jesus said to the Pharisees there, he says, unless you likewise repent, you will likewise rep- perish. Repentance is just a change of mind concerning sin. He also said in Matthew 10, 31 and 32, or 32, 33, excuse me, the one who confesses me before men, I'll confess them before my Father who is in heaven. The one who denies me before men, I'll deny before my Father in heaven. And he said also in Mark 16 and also Matthew 28, uh, that before he ascended to heaven, that the one who believed in him and is baptized, that's the one who will be saved. Maybe you have needed that this morning. There'll be an opportunity in just a moment. Maybe you're in sin and you need to restore yourself to God or to the church. Maybe you've fallen away and need to be restored to right fellowship. We repent of that sin, confess it before God and pray about it. Maybe you're a Christian and you're just struggling. You need prayers or you want to identify with the work here. Our elders stand ready after services to talk to you if you would like to uh, be identified with the work. But if you have any spiritual need, um, we're about ready to sing a song in just a moment and we encourage you to come forward.